Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach to health. I am Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And now we're going to be talking about underrated supplements. So supplements that you may have heard of, supplements you may not have heard of, but ones that we feel have particularly interesting effects or uh, potentially, you know, effects that people have not familiar with these supplements also have. So let's start with um, CoQ10. So I hear a lot about mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, no one seems to be able to explain exactly what that is, but CoQ10 helps that. So why isn't everybody taking it? Yeah, so uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, um, there is a lot of things to think about. One of them is age, how your proteins are folding. One is how your nutrients are crossing the mitochondria membrane. It's actually a double membrane. Um, the carnitine palmitoyl coenzyme A uh, shuttle actually helps shuttle nutrients across, um, specifically uh, certain types of fatty acids. But um, there is also an enzyme called coenzyme Q10, and that helps convert NAD plus to ATP, ATP, which is cellular energy, and then to tie it together, um, Creatine can help be another donor for energy to make ATP with creatine phosphate. But uh, to kind of get back to the underrated, overrated aspect of CoQ10, we do think it is a little bit underrated. In some spheres, it might be a bit overrated, but in many individuals, it is very underrated. And some of these individuals might be uh, aging individuals. They tend to have more mitochondrial dysfunction. Individuals who um, use a lot of energy. They burn a lot of energy in the mitochondria. For example, someone doing very vigorous exercise or individuals taking a statin. Of course, if you meet all three of this criteria, you are a perfect candidate for uh, taking coenzyme Q10. So is coenzyme Q10 like a octane booster for your fuel? And if we're looking at the different things that plug into you know, the, the Krebs cycle, right? Creating cellular energy, the mitochondrial function, you know, why wouldn't I just take more B12? Because that's on the list as well, as opposed to taking just coenzyme Q10. It can be the rate limiting step. So if you think about the process of um, fuel, um, to oversimplify it, sometimes you make the analogy like a Formula One car. So you have the fuel pump and uh, carnitine, the shuttle is one of those fuel pumps. You also have the backup fuel tank, that's creatine. You have the pre-fuel, that's like NMN, NR, even niacin to some degree, but especially NAD+. And the fuel activator is CoQ10. So you can get what's called an NAD depletion myalgia. Um, and there's a lot of ways to cure that. Niacin, just niacin, will um, cure an NAD depletion myalgia. But if you have a CoQ10 depletion myalgia, of which we know that statins decrease CoQ10, then only that last rate limiting step will fix it. So maybe if your CoQ10 is the rate limiting step, you're running on six cylinders instead of eight because your spark plugs aren't firing. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, uh, of note with CoQ10, a lot of clinicians and scientists will bring up the studies that were done um, on du dual drugs. So I assume that these were like phase two and phase three clinical trials. I don't remember exactly which phase they were in, but um, pharmaceutical companies certainly looked at um, combining statins with CoQ10, but like any other study, there's a selection bias and the selection bias that they wanted for those studies is the general population, because when you have a drug, you want to be able to market it to ideally everyone, um, but if not everyone, every person that would be taking a statin. Otherwise, that seems reasonable. Um, if they had selected for individuals who are only over a certain age and only doing a certain amount of exercise, so a lot of exercise, then it's uh, theoretically would have been much more likely to have um, good results in these trials. Uh, in another subgroup they were looking at, is specifically, I think this is mentioned in the Merck patent, is individuals with uh, congestive heart failure, because a lot of times someone has a heart attack, uh, they lose some of their cardiovascular function, lose some of the ejection fraction, and then those individuals are placed on a statin to greatly reduce their risk of having another heart attack. And adding coenzyme Q10 into there would be a you know really a no-brainer if someone has reduced cardiac output, because there are some studies that specifically look at that and they see some improvements. That's not going to 
reverse someone's advanced end stage heart failure, but it will shift things in the right direction in a mm -hmm. small way. Like many other things, we do like to check CoQ10 levels and then see where things stack up. Anecdotally, and there's not, a, hopefully they will research this more, but anecdotally, individuals who have um, very beneficial lipoprotein profiles or they don't have any issues with cholesterol, they have very low LDL at baseline, not on any meds, very low ApoB at baseline, perhaps they have a mutation in PSCK9 or LDL receptor or whatever the case may be, or just um, less HMGC or reductase activity. I've seen several of these, of these individuals with very low CoQ10 levels at baseline, which is, um, I suppose, maybe a little bit, it, it makes sense physiologically because you're essentially just genetically predisposed to be in a statin-like state. That's interesting. Yeah. And I, I suppose the trend that I've seen, I don't know that I've seen a correlation or enough of these to kind of point in the direction of lower lipids and less coenzyme Q10, but certainly as people increase in age, mm -hmm. I've seen a much lower level, sometimes even actually flagged as low by the yeah. laboratory where it's a, still a pretty broad range. Usually it goes from about you know, 0 0.5 to two or sometimes even higher. Uh, and some of these people are off the charts low in their serum coenzyme Q10, which mm -hmm. doesn't tell us the full story, but I would suspect all other things equal, someone with a low serum level compared to someone with a serum level of three would stand to benefit from coenzyme Q10. And I don't know if this is being looked at in some of the studies that are done, like what someone's starting coenzyme Q10 is. So there's a lot of very niche individualized studies that we would love to see done or mm -hmm. love to do someday, but I don't believe the results are out there yet. If someone does find one of those, please send them our way because I would love to see that. Definitely. Um, we're always trying to find new studies. I would say a day probably doesn't go by without us wanting to see or looking for a study on a very specific group of individuals. Often the niche is too small. And unfortunately, often the study group that we want to see is individuals who exercise a lot, especially in older age, which is exceedingly hard to find in um, given that there's just not that many people doing that in this country. Yeah, and that's the opposite trend you would tend to see with aging, um, even on, among those who are in this sort of uh, above average or elite fitness categories, they tend to still have a decrease in their activity levels as they increase uh, age, especially in older age. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the question that a lot of people have is like, is this sort of sarcopenia and loss of aerobic capacity entirely aging or is there some component of this decreased activity that is leading to that? Because you really have to have perhaps not as much for the sarcopenia, the muscle mass and the strength, but for aerobic capacity, the time investment is going to be pretty proportional to the increase in aerobic capacity you have up until you reach sort of the you know elite status, which yeah. takes a ton of time per week to do. Yeah, um, that's a great point. And hopefully more research into um, anti-aging. I saw a poll, by the way, where should the most money in research go? Cancer, diabetes, or anti-aging? Um, and, and cancer got the most votes, which is, I guess, somewhat reasonable. Diabetes got the least number of votes. But anti-aging got a decent number of votes. But what does that really even mean? So what we just described, that's kind of what it means to us. Yeah, I think, and, and this was Dr. Morgan Levine, or Levine, I believe, that kind of the first person I saw using the term was preventing system decline. And it's you know, not fancy, it's not clickbaity, it hasn't been picked up by the media, but I think it's very accurate because yeah. for cancer, for example, we want the immune system to behave more like a younger immune system so that it's going to pick off those atypical cells or those yeah. cancer cells before they become a problem. So I, I think that's a pretty good framework and kind of how we evaluate it. Mm -hmm. Speaking of preventing system decline, we like to talk about protein a lot. Plant protein is our next underrated supplement, believe it or not. Plant protein, underrated. It's interesting to see the, the dichotomy here online between plant protein and animal protein. And I, I think arguably it, it doesn't matter that much if you look at the general population and perhaps what's in their breakfast. Mm -hmm. Now they would mostly stand to benefit from increasing protein in that meal. Yep. But uh, as, as we've kind of discussed in the past, looking at your specific protein timing um, and then like nutrient sensing and shifting more of that to the morning, uh, perhaps the more you know anabolic 
um, sorts of protein, where they're more complete proteins, more leucine content. Yep. Makes sense when you are the most nutrient sensitive in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, but plant protein, and then it's hard to say whether collagen protein is underrated or overrated, but perhaps it is the uh, specifics of this, the timing that's more important that could determine if it's overrated mm -hmm. or underrated. Especially the timing of the two, it's very frequent to see people take glycine, which is a specific amino acid, but also an inhibitory neurotransmitter. A lot of people will take a high amount of glycine in the evening before bed. Collagen happens to have a lot of glycine in it. So um, that's a benefit. You wouldn't have to take an additional glycine supplement. And you can combine it with plant protein. That way it's complements of amino acids are not going to overly activate mTOR. That way you don't have um, the downside of affecting mTOR all the time. The law of diminishing returns applies. So for individuals that are already consuming a lot of protein, that, are, that still want to have protein sources available during sleep for muscle protein synthesis, but they do not want to have overactive mTOR1 and 2, plant protein makes a lot of sense in the evening along with a bit of collagen. Yeah, and for that reason, we think uh, plant protein plus collagen protein taken specifically in the evening would be a underrated or perhaps even unknown supplement combo at this time. Yep, very underrated for a balanced approach to health. Um, perhaps if you were a big Rami or someone, then it would be overrated. <laughs> um, next one, um, we've been talking about muscle protein synthesis. A lot of people like to talk about myostatin inhibitors. So, um, you know, I guess when these first started to, and they're both natural and there's both uh, research chemicals that have been looked at as myostatin inhibitors for many reasons in dogs and humans. Um, in general, when they first came out, they were extremely overrated. Um, and a lot of people say that they are completely worthless, but um, we think that they are underrated in a specific category. Yeah, and this is something I believe I posted on Instagram about quite some time ago. There's actually a patent that was placed on a sirtuin-1 inhibitor um, that also may be a myostatin inhibitor. So mm -hmm. maybe they think that it's working by inhibiting sirtuin-1, but it may actually be working through another mechanism, which would be interesting. You know, findings are often serendipitous in science, but... Mm -hmm. Looking at who would benefit the most from myostatin inhibition, um, what age group do you think this would apply to? The potential most beneficial group is a fetus. So um, I love practicing pediatrics. I love delivering babies, birth to death, true full spectrum medicine. And in individuals that have risk of poor muscle tone, there's actually studies looking at several things in pregnancy, not to derail too much from myostat inhibitors, but two of them are epicatechin. Uh, epicatechin, um, there's many different types. Um, there is one type, uh, epigyocatechin or EGCG, that is used for a lot of other things. Um, but there's also epicatechins in chocolate. A lot of people take a supplement called Cocovia. I have no relation to the company, but it's just a natural source of cocoa that also has epicatechin in it. And it is a relatively weak and well-tolerated myostatin inhibitor. It also works something called folostatin. But basically, as um, you are accruing muscle protein, myostatin increases and then stops that. So this is part of the reason why you can't just take more, for example, androgen and growth hormone and grow muscle indefinitely. There's other myostatin inhibitors that are just research chemicals like YK11, which we would not recommend for any human. <laughs> But um, there is other natural ones as well. One of them is called fortitropin. Um, and this fortitropin is used in dogs. I actually started to become interested in it because I have an Irish wolfhound that is starting to have some trouble getting up. And there's decent evidence in canines that um, this fortitropin can help um, kind of regain some strength. But in the pediatric population, specifically infants that have been uh, introduced to solid food, that would, um, you're thinking about like, you want them to walk better, you want them to um, like meet their physical therapy milestones, if you will, perhaps they're on an IEP with a PT or an OT. This is a reasonable thing to add in, um, given that they love it and um, it tastes good. And it actually comes from fertilized egg yolk embryos, which kind of reminded me of Mike O'Hearn and giving his kids the fertilized duck eggs. 
maybe that's what raised his genetic ceiling. If he was raised on duck eggs and he's raising his children on duck eggs, there might be something to it. But is this just going to work in people who are, let's say, you know, behind kids who are behind on their milestones? Or is this potentially looking at uh, some sort of a legacy effect where some benefit might be carried over um, just based on meeting those de developmental milestones earlier, or even raising the, I guess, ceiling of the amount of muscle mass one could accumulate? It likely does raise the ceiling of the amount of muscle mass. This is also true health optimization. You look at uh, a cattle breed like the Belgian blue, and there's also mice that have been given these research chemicals, but the Belgian blue um, has a myostatin gene, I believe, deletion. So it does not work whatsoever. And that is obviously the case all the way from when they're an embryo and a fetus and a baby cow, um, a calf. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, they have an extremely high amount of muscle mass. Um, you can Google Belgian blue. Our friend Derek's also made a video about it. So yes, um, with these safe myostatin inhibitors, fortitropin, epicatechin, um, often in individuals that are like six months and older, incorporating these into the diet might improve their health optimization, athleticism, muscle mass, like raising their overall ceiling indefinitely. Yeah, and this is interesting to me from a you know population health standpoint because we have, and this is kind of getting off on a rabbit trail, but we have more metabolically unhealthy people now that are conceiving and sort of you know predisposing their children to worse metabolic health, less lean body mass later in life. So I don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this would shift the balance you know, at all at a population level, but it would certainly be less of a population problem as far as the metabolic diseases if let's say at age 16 the average teenager has you know 10 or 15 pounds more lean body mass because yep. their metabolic rate is going to be higher they're going to be better able to dispose of their you know glucose and they're going to sort of be less inclined to snowball into poor metabolic health compared to someone who has that same 15 pounds but it is adipose tissue instead mm -hmm. of lean body mass Maybe there would also be less sexless young men. So perhaps there would be a social benefit too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And what about, what are these bug and plant steroids, the ecdysterones? Yeah. yeah. So I can't tell if bug and plant steroids are extremely overrated or extremely underrated. A lot of our, um, like both friends and uh, favorite influencers have made videos about these or even have their own supplements but these are terkesterone and beta ecdysterone. And um, one thing that we like about these is that they have a relatively well characterized or relatively well theorized mechanism of action. They bind the beta estradiol receptor. Yeah, and exoskeletons aside, is this why ants are able to lift six times their body weight or something <laughs> preposterous of that nature because they're full of terkesterone? Probably not, um, but uh, you know, I guess it, <laughs> it, it might not hurt, but um, in general, there uh, is a group or a patient population that theoretically could benefit a ton from ecdysteroids. And these are people that are in estrogen deficient states or especially on high doses of aromatase inhibitors. So you're thinking about postmenopausal females also on an aromatase inhibitor or someone who has to take a really high dose of an aromatase inhibitor. Uh, I can't think of many other scenarios, but there's certainly people that are. Yeah, it, on the, you know, there's a lot of examples on the you know, female side. Uh, looking at, I guess, an even more specific niche, if you look at men with, let's say, prostate cancer on androgen deprivation therapy, yep. they, in theory, should have quite a low level of estradiol because they have a low net level of androgens. And if you're looking at the sarcopenia that happens there, mm -hmm. if you can agonize that estrogen beta receptor with something like an ecdysterone, mm -hmm. then that may have a positive effect, not necessarily on the cancer, that's really difficult to say, yeah. but on at least their you know, insulin sensitivity, lean body mass, and sort of everything in that, um, in that sort of uh, under that umbrella or in that bucket. Mm -hmm. Bioidentical estradiol certainly is used for therapies in some prostate cancers, but um, it's unknown. And not to get off into too much of a rabbit trail, the ratio of estradiol alpha to estradiol beta receptors in the prostate, which is largely genetic, also determines 
a lot of the predisposition towards prostate cancer. That's why something like raloxifene, which is an uh, basically an agonist in some receptors and an antagonist in some receptors, um, might slow the growth of prostate cancer or make it slightly less likely to develop, but have a lot of other side effects as well. Um, all that to say, something that is just a beta, re beta estradiol receptor agonist is probably not gonna have a huge benefit, but that receptor is in muscle tissue. So um, for those individuals, um, you know, breast cancer, prostate cancer, on aromatase inhibitors, potentially very underrated. All right, and then we have Tudka, um, which you made a fantastic post with our friend Lucas about recently because mm -hmm. really in, in an interesting turn of events, there was a supplement combined with another supplement that became a medication. Yeah. But I thought supplements and medicines were totally different. And if you go and, you know, let's say you walk into the average family medicine office, they're going to tell you, oh, you know, you don't need to worry about supplements. They're not going to do anything for you. But here we had a FDA approval for a serious neurodegenerative condition mm -hmm. between uh, Tudka and sodium phenylbutyrate, if I recall correctly. Yeah. So the combination of the two was uh, approved for ALS. So I guess if there's anybody with ALS that was previously on both Tutka and sodium phenylbutyrate, um, props to them. It's not a cure-all, but it certainly does help. Um, there's a lot of various benefits of Tutka. Tutka is very similar to Udka, which is also known as Ursodiol. The U um, in Ursodiol is the U in Tutka as well. And Ursa is the root word for bear. Uh, they found it in, I believe, the, the bile of the bear. And it's part of the reason why they can have um, so much hepatotoxic, they can eat a lot of things that are hepatotoxic and the liver of the bear itself is very toxic with fat soluble vitamins. Um, but basically it's a, it's a better version of a bile acid and it has a lot of um, benefits, not just with digestion and then the gastrointestinal system, but also uh, inside the cell as well. I guess you could say, the bear that takes in something liver toxic, they barely feel it. Yeah, they barely feel it. <laughs> um, good candidates for this, high bile acids, high uric acid, um, someone with cholestasis, so there's the high bile acids. Um, someone with uh, potentially a lot of biliary stasis or biliary dyskinesia, that would make sense. Um, sometimes very estrogen dominant states that could potentially help. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, potential cases of people, perhaps people that are predisposed to ALS that could be reasonable yeah. as well. And if you look at, you know, some of the population level, like who is having like gallbladder issues and gallstones, you can kind of get a sense of who would be good candidates for this. So, um, women in middle age, women who are overweight, women taking oral contraceptives or in a high estrogen state yep. would all seem to be good candidates. And interestingly, as of late, there's a medication that is being used by a lot of these women for weight loss. And how could weight loss possibly be harmful for someone like that, Kyle? Yeah, uh, more intrahepatic, uh, basically biliary sludge building up and more gallstones. Now there's actually a warning for uh, semaglutide, which is a GLP-1 for uh, gallstones and gallbladder attacks. So it is not uncommon that I prescribe uh, the Ursodiol or the Udka version of this uh, if they are at high risk, of, and not just females as well, mm -hmm. um, men with estrogen dominance as well, that are at risk of having that build up and back up in the biliary system and having to get their gallbladder out. Yeah, so a good history and a good family history is you're very important whenever you're treating even something where it's just like, oh, weight loss, that's a, a no-brainer. Let's get this person more metabolically healthy. Mm -hmm. So if you are an individual who is using some glutide for weight loss, the speed of the weight loss can also affect how often you, or how likely you are to experience this sort of gallbladder sludge or gallstones. Mm -hmm. So if you lost 20 pounds a month and you're happy and your provider's happy because you're making great progress, um, you may be at a higher risk for getting a gallstone. So this could be something to consider and discuss with your provider. Yeah, that's certainly the case. Um, if you're losing weight and you're not doing so with the um, it's not supervised by a healthcare professional. There's a difference between physician supervised 
and uh, like a program like Slim for, Slim for Life, although Slim for Life now prescribes GLP-1, so it's very confusing. Um, but anyway, if that's not the case that you're having direct oversight with a healthcare provider, then less than about eight pounds a month is a reasonable goal to shoot for. The yeah. slower, the better, really. Yeah. And people may lose a little bit more the first month with you know things like fluid retention or glycogen, glycogen if they're yeah. doing keto. I think we did a podcast on that recently. We did. As well. We just did. But uh, in any case, what about the other part of this new drug for ALS? So the I guess sodium butyrate, butyrate, sodium phenyl butyrate. You know, these things sort of get thrown around. Mm -hmm. um, but what is I guess why is this an underrated supplement? Because it's been around for a long time. There's a lot of preclinical data, a lot of clinical data. Mm -hmm. It seems to be like negative calories for mice. Is that the same for humans? Not quite. Um, very few rodent studies translate directly into human studies, as our friend Alec McCarthy likes to point out. But um, there is particularly interesting categories for use. For example, there is a study on pediatric obesity, and they actually looked at the, the microbiome as uh, an outcome. And a lot of times butyrate is used as it is a postbiotic, so it does affect the gut microbiome, that's well known. Um, and uh, there's a lot of forms of it, but, uh, and there's other things other than sodium butyrate that can have an effect, but butyrate can also have an epigenetic effect. I don't believe they studied this within this population group, but um, it, it's interesting because you're thinking about the adolescent patient population. It's, uh, we used to think that uh, people with pediatric obesity would grow out of their obesity. But now it looks after that New England Journal of Medicine study a couple of years ago that 90% uh, of them kind of grow back into it um, in, their, in the end of their teenage years or when they're 20 or 21. So this is kind of a chance to not only alter their gut microbiome, which is going to change their serotonergic and dopaminergic signaling, but also kind of shift and shuffle their epigenetics while they are being healthy. They, of course, uh, compared it to standard of care, which is diet and exercise. So it seems like a really good idea that while you're implementing lifestyle measures like diet and exercise, shuffle the card deck of their epigenome and uh, try to have as many positive genes turned on as possible. Right, because we know that if someone was you know, obese or is obese during adolescence, that the, the deck is sort of stacked against them. You hear this you know, conversation about genetics and environment as being, you know, 100% causal of obesity. And I, I guess you could also make the argument that genetics and environment is 100% causal of everything, because mm -hmm. that's really the, the interactions that are occurring there. But there are, you know, these, this is a fairly recent study, I think a really promising intervention. Um, and they carried it out over quite a long time period, I believe it was six months in this case. Mm -hmm. And the calorie tracking is always particularly interesting when they look at this. Um, and look at the you know, calorie intake, what people, usually what they reported unless they're providing the entirety of the food. Right. And then we know people are still going to you know, snack from time to time. That's yeah. why low saturated fat diets work better in the hospital than out of the hospital, <laughs> even though people are eating the same exact foods. It's a good point on the diets. Um, regarding diets, you're thinking about a lot of other outcomes other than just calories, but it's always important to track the calories. It would have been nice to see um, how the intake of for example, specific types of carbohydrates would have changed, ultra processed versus processed versus um, like whole carbohydrates, how fiber would have changed. Um, but uh, a few other outcomes that the study looked at was ghrelin, a hunger hormone. Yeah, and we're, you know, get a lot of questions about ghrelin, uh, mainly because this is the action that some of these, uh, you know, growth hormone secretagogues work through. And whenever you have this sort of ghrelin increase, uh, it's almost a, you know, insatiable hunger that people have where mm -hmm. they can eat and eat and it kind of induces a state of hyperphagia. So it would be interesting to see if the individuals taking the butyrate or making, let's just say, like higher quality food choices or more informed dietary choices, if they were less susceptible to the, let's say, pressure of, you know, driving by a fast food restaurant or having a candy bar mm -hmm. or things of that nature that are quite easy to do, quite accessible, but everyone knows, I always make this example, no one is fooled by the vitamins and minerals label on the Pop-Tarts. People yeah. know what foods are inflammatory, harmful, and what foods are beneficial. 
It's just that you know the deck is stacked against mm -hmm. people. But the ghrelin is particularly interesting because that could give them a, an edge in food selection, even though it didn't lead to less calories. And actually, the group supplementing with butyrate took in slightly less fiber. I don't believe it was a significant amount. They were both eating around 15 to 20 grams of fiber per day, which is still quite low, but about yeah. in line with the average American, which I believe is about 10 to 15, depending mm -hmm. on the study you look at. I believe it was kinesiologist Greg Doucette that said, you don't want ghrelin hitting you in the face. So perhaps there is a way other than just consuming uh, foods of low caloric density to decrease ghrelin signaling. Sodium butyrate could be a good option. Yeah. What if there was a fiber that would increase butyrate production in the gut? Yeah, um, there happens to be. Isn't it called inulin? Yep. So um, fiber is interesting. You can think about uh, prebiotic fibers. You can think about soluble fibers. Uh, uh, you can think about dietary and non-dietary fibers. But in general, a broad spectrum of many different types of fiber is better. So, you know, you incorporate a little bit of inulin. And yes, some people with ragweed allergies might have a touch of re reactivity with inulin made from chicory root because it's from the same family as ragweed, but probably not. I'm allergic to ragweed and I tolerate it fine. But you, instead of supplementing with a huge amount of inulin or a huge amount of psyllium, you incorporate some inulin, some aribinoglycan, some psyllium, some guar fiber, some green banana flour, um, and other resistant starches, um, and maybe some, uh, you know, all these other different types of fiber to create like a, a broad spectrum fiber, similar to how instead of just using one probiotic, you use several different prebiotics. It sounds like it's, uh, it's sort of a fiber breakdown you might get from eating a balanced diet. Yeah, or just eat a balanced diet. Yeah. And personally for myself, uh, when the new year rolled around, I am making a a uh, very cognizant effort to keep my intake of fruits and vegetables very high and mm -hmm. chronically high. And onions are a part of that, and specifically mm -hmm. red onions. And I know that onions are also a great source of inulin. Yep. So I might be cranking up my butyrate production just by this simple dietary change, which you know, I was unaware of until I looked at the study and then went another level deeper. And I wish that stores around me had pre-sliced red onions. I can find white onions pre-sliced all day long, but I have to slice my own red onions and that makes my eyes water. Perhaps that could be a treatment for dry eye. Yeah, I, I guess it could. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's another good example of uh, food as medicine. So I guess in context with this entire supplement discussion, just like our overrated supplements, um, you can make any change. For example, you can eat a lot of fruits and vegetables with polyphenols in them. And that's probably the best nootropic that you can do compared to if you're trying to figure out, well, do I need this nootropic or this nootropic? So food certainly is medicine. Um, one other uh, alternative to discuss is a lot of people, or by a lot of people, I mean specifically biohackers like to discuss epigenetics or methylation, demethylation, acetylation, deacetylation of DNA. Is the histone protein going to be bound there to turn on the gene or off the gene? We briefly discussed butyrate's um, potential benefit with that. It's likely a much better choice than sodium valproate, which is a medication with lots of side effects. Um, but we should add in uh, methyl donors as well. So it's kind of become in vogue to check MTHFR polymorphisms. There's a lot more mutations than just the two major SNPs that are checked. So you can have, I, I suppose, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 of the SNP if you're not doing full exome or full genome sequencing. But uh, is there such a thing as too much methylation? Because methylating DNA would turn often on epigenetics too, wouldn't it? The supplement companies would say, no, you cannot have too many methyl groups being donated. You want homocysteine as low as possible because uh, doesn't it cause cancer and heart disease and cognitive decline? I think one out of those three is somewhat conclusive in certain settings, uh, mm -hmm. like the size of someone's brain over time if they have elevated homocysteine and a quite low level of b12 then that's a pretty compelling case for adding in some b12 perhaps methylated to pull yep. down the homocysteine because we're all going to lose some brain mass but when we talk mm -hmm. about preventing system decline we're going to lose as little brain mass as possible yep eliminating methionine from the diet should also decrease homocysteine precipitously <laughs> <laughs> so you should obviously you shouldn't do that um but uh, yeah, there's a kind of a controversy, especially in prenatal care with pregnant females or pregnant women that um, 
there is kind of like a limit of how much L-methylfolate or how much methyl cobalamin, which is methyl B12, they should take. And um, what I recommend to individuals is not taking over, um, you know, 600, 800 micrograms or so of either, but still check your MMA, which is methylmalonic acid, still check your homocysteine, still check your B12 and folate and help that guide therapy more than even your genotype. Yeah, because you, you can have a, a genotype and you can have a, like for a long time, it wasn't known that there were these sort of protective polymorphisms mm -hmm. against like Alzheimer's, for example. Um, this may be one of the reasons that you see the APOE4 phenotype having less of an effect in certain ethnic groups because they may be more likely to carry these protective polymorphisms. Mm -hmm. So your genetics are not necessarily your destiny. Uh, even in the highest polygenic risk scores for cardiovascular disease, people that are following the best practices for lifestyle can reduce their risk by 50%, mm -hmm. which is a substantial number I would have guessed, you know, if I hadn't seen the study that would be much lower. Yep. But it's a pretty substantial improvement that people can make regardless of where they're at or what their genetics look like. I think that's a great summary to tie it all together. There are many actionable items that you can do regardless of your genotype or predisposition to achieve health optimization, whether it's preventing neurodegenerative disease, which will be a podcast in and of itself, or preventing cardiovascular disease, which we will continue to do podcasts on. So as always, thank you for joining us. We uh, may God give you health and happiness.